All right, everybody, welcome back to the number one television program in the history of the entire universe. I am Brian Lee Durfee, author of The Forgetting Moon, The Blackest Heart, and The Lonesome Crown, all three books published by Simon & Schuster's Saga Press. Today we're going to be doing a book discussion on Stephen King's Needful Things. Um, if you followed my channel for any length of time, you know I read and reviewed on the channel every single Stephen King book in order of publication. Um, but those were uh, non-spoiler book reviews. So this series of uh, book discussions is we're going to do spoilers and everything. We're going to talk about these books in depth stuff that I liked about them, the endings, the way they ended, different characters, different plot points, all that kind of stuff. You know, we've done a handful so far. Now we're to needful things. I've got two versions here. I've got the original hardcover copy I bought a long time ago and a little paperback copy. Now, um, one thing is this is a book that came out in 1991, so let's do a little history of the book. It came out in 1991. Um, on the cover here, it says... The very last Castle Rock story, which is weird because I've read this book four or five times now in my life. It's the first time. This, this reading is the first time I noticed it said the very last Castle Rock story. Now, if you, as you know, um, Stephen King sets all of his books in, well, most of his books, a good portion of his books in Maine. In two different towns. Castle Rock is one of the towns, and then Derry, Maine is the other town. And, um, you know, then there's, you know, another 10 or so books that are set elsewhere in the world and stuff. But um, most of it takes place in these uh, small Maine communities. Small town stuff, small Maine communities. Um, and we're going to get into the significance of why those small towns and the New England landscape is so important to King novels as we discuss this book particularly. So, what are some of the other Castle Rock stories? Well, of course, Cujo, The Dark Half. Um, God, those are the only two that I can think of off the top of my head. Should have done a little research on this before I started talking about it. But there's a bunch. There's a, there's a bunch. Um, so, Castle Rock is a small town in Maine where a lot of bad things have happened. And some recurring characters show up in all of these books. Okay, so... This is the quintessential Stephen King novel, in my opinion. I mean, I love the covers. I mean, this cover is one of my favorite Stephen King covers. I love the gold foil um, thing here. I love the red. I love the font. I love the picture of the main street with the store. And even if you, um, I mean, I, I know you can't see it in this lighting, but the, uh, the cover is a wrapper. Or maybe it's easier to see on this one. The cover is a wraparound of a of a old of a New England main street. And one of the things I like about this cover is even taking away, even if you were to take away needful things in Stephen King and just show the painting itself. I think you would immediately think of a Stephen King horror novel. Quintessential Stephen King book cover for the quintessential Stephen King novel. In fact, this is after the Green Mile, when people come to me and say, hey, which Steve, I've never read Stephen King before. Which Stephen King novels should I start with? I always say the Green Mile, um, because that's kind of universally liked. That's a story that everybody can get into. But if you really want to know what Stephen King's horror novels are like, I would start with Needful Things because it's a very good entry into the Stephen King universe. So this book starts with, like I said, in Castle Rock, Maine, with a very gorgeously written, um, poetic opening prologue, um, almost written as poetry, just the writing is superb, of a description of the town and the characters themselves. I know that sounds daunting, but the way Stephen King writes it is he sets up this lovely opening of what is it like to live in a small town in Maine, specifically specifically Castle Rock? Oh, I forgot. There are some Castle Rock stories that he wrote after Needful Things. Those are the Gwendy Button Box trilogy. So technically, those would be the last Castle Rock stories. And those just came out a few years ago. So forget everything I said about the last Castle Rock story. 
this little thing up here is a lie. I digress. Let's get back to the let's let's get back to the main the main thrust of this. Um. Okay. So, Castle Rock, Maine. In October, near Halloween, this is Stephen King territory. And he describes it right up front in the book of the prologue. We've got the autumn weather, the autumn leaves, the autumn, the New England autumn, just, the, it all just oozes. We're setting up for a big, bad horror novel here. And it's an epic one, too. It's about 700 pages. It's just one of my favorites. In fact, I think if you... Go to my top, like my 94 Stephen King novel rankings video. I think this was in the top 10. I'm pretty sure it was in the top 10. So um, we start out with um, even a couple of references, like I said, to the previous um, Stephen King novels, like Cujo and the Dark Half. Uh, we get those right off the bat. Um, Brian Rusk, we open with Brian Rusk. He's an 11-year-old kid. So we get this lovely prologue that I just told you about that hints... And lays little layers and hints, and and it's got an undertone of even though it's a lovely prologue, it's got this undertone of evil is gonna. You're about to read an evil book here, and so get prepared, strap in, folks. And we start with Brian Rusk. He's an 11 year old kid. As we get into the main story, um, he is on his bicycle and he sees that there's a new store opening, Needful Things, um, and he goes up to the store, and he's never seen the store before. Um, in this small town. And, 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 and one of the things that Stephen King does really well is describe what it's like in a small town when a new business shows up. And I lived in a small town in southern Utah. And yeah, and when a new business shows up, it's a big deal. People like talk about it. They gossip about it. Like, what's it going to be like? Is it going to put... Is it going to put my business out of business? Is it going to, um, what's it going to do? What are they going to sell? Who's, who's the owner? Now, sometimes in a small town, you know the owner already. It's, a, it's already one of the people that you've lived with in the community. So you want to really support their business to begin with. Um, but if it's an outsider, you're very skeptical. Stephen King does a really great job of setting all of that up in the beginning of this book. Now, Brian Rusk, he's the first one to kind of stumble upon the store and he sees the sign on the store. The sign says, Grand Opening October 9th. But it's not October 9th. It's a few days before October 9th. So Brian Rusk is like, oh, well, I guess I won't go in. And the sign says, Grand Opening October 9th. Bring your friends. This is a new kind of store. And you won't believe your eyes. That is what the sign says. And then Brian Rusk, as he's kind of investigating the storefront a little bit, he notices that he can get in. He opens the door and goes in. And there he meets um, our man Leland Gaunt, um, who is, I think, one of my favorite Stephen King villains. Um, uh, he's just an older man, but dashingly charming, very, got like, sort of an edgy sort of vibe to the way he moves and the way he talks and the way he dresses. He always seems to say the right thing to the right people at the right time. Um, as Brian Rusk is entering the store, we're kind of getting a little bit of a, an, kind of an omnipresent view from the, like the story is not told first person. The story is told from an omnipresent narrator that's showing a lot of different perspectives of a lot of the different characters in this small town. And nobody does small town life better than Stephen King. We're going to get into that a little bit too later in this talking, uh, this discussion. So one of the people that we get to see early on from their perspective is Brian Rusk's mother, Cora, as she gossips about this new, uh, uh, store needful things. What's it going to be like? Who's who's the owner? Are we going to support it? Are we going to are we going to like the people that run it? Whatever. And as she's gossiping about this over the phone, she's kind of also half watching the soap opera Santa Barbara, um, which King does really well of layering in different um, different pop culture things that were important at the time he was writing this. This was 1991. Santa Barbara was one of the big, huge soap operas they used to play during the day. During the like the late 80s, early 90s, it was very popular. I remember watching it. I can't remember, believe I admitted that. What am I doing? 
I loved Santa Barbara. It was, uh, you know, I was a young college student and that Santa Barbara was always on TV during my lunch hour in the cafeteria of the, of the dormitory I lived in. And all of us kids, all of us watched it. Everybody in the cafeteria watched Santa Barbara during lunch. Okay. Anyway, moving on. Um, so anyway, Brian Rusk meets Leland Gaunt. And the store is weird. When he, opened, when he first goes in, the store is weird. It's like it's got a weird eclectic... Like, there's just no theme at all to the store. It's just got a little bit of everything. And um, he talks to Leland Gaunt, the owner of the store. And um, Leland Gaunt is, of course, of charming to Brian. And, and he, he strikes up a conversation with this young boy and, and, like, gets to know what the young boy's into. And the young boy, Brian, says, I love baseball cards. I collect baseball cards. And, of course, Leland Gaunt is like, oh, my gosh. I've got some of the best baseball cards in the world. You'd love to look at my collection. And then Brian is like... Oh my God, I love Sandy Koufax. I've got all these Sandy Koufax uh, baseball cards I'm collecting, but there's only a few left that I need to complete my collection. But they're so expensive. They're so rare and expensive. I'll never have them. And then Leland Gaunt is kind of like, oh, well, you know, I think I might remember seeing some Sandy Koufax. Let me go back and look. And of course, he pulls out this mint condition collection of baseball cards. And sure enough, there's the very, the very card that Brian wants is in the collection. Not only is it one of the rarest cards in the world, but Sandy Koufax has signed it to Brian. It says to Brian, Sandy Koufax. So not only is it a rare card, it just happens to be signed with the very same name as Brian. And so Brian is like, Oh my God, his mind is blown. He wants this. He lusts after this card. Immediately feels drawn to this card. It's almost as if a supernatural power might be drawing him into this card, that he needs this card. And Leland Gaunt is like, I know you can't afford it, but I'll take whatever change you've got in your pocket, But and you can have the card, but I need you to do a deed for me. And then he whispers the deed into Brian's ear. And as Brian is leaving the store, He's like, he kind of forgets what the deed is. He's like, what was that deed? Well, it's, we will find out later in the book what the deed is. But this is a great way that Stephen King sets up suspense is it's very unique to Stephen King. Like he will hint, bad things are going to happen. The reader knows, the characters don't know, but the reader knows bad things are going to happen. We don't know what the deed is. Brian has been told the deed, but he doesn't remember what the deed is. But we know some horrific shit's going to go down in Castle Rock, Maine, just because of the way Stephen King writes that scene. Next, we get a character, Polly Chalmers. Now, she goes into needful things a little bit early, too. Actually, she might be the first one to go in on opening day. Like, nobody wants to be the first. Everybody's like, well, we know the store just opened. Well, we're not going to be the first one in. Somebody has to be first. Well, Polly Chalmers, she's the first one in. And she goes into the store. Now, Polly Chalmers is dating the police officer in the town named Alan Pangborn. Now, of course, Alan Pangborn is one of my favorite characters from a few Stephen King novels, most notably The Dark Half and Needful Things. He takes a big role in both of those. He is one of my favorite characters. In fact, when I did my Stephen King discussion with Mike's book reviews, he asked me, who's your favorite Stephen King character? And I'm like, I like Alan Pangborn because he's a police officer. And, and I just, I like the guy. He just seems like a good guy, a good character. And some of my favorite books have him in it. So, um, but Polly Chalmers is dating Alan Pangborn. Alan himself, um, his backstory is um, he's been in some other books. We know that his wife and daughter were killed in uh, some sort of accident. And so they're deceased and he's working through the trauma of that. But he's dating, he's moving on, he's dating this Polly Chalmers. Now Polly Chalmers has arthritis. And arthritis, um, she goes into the store and of course she is immediately charmed by this devilishly charming Leland Gaunt. And uh, so she's kind of sucked into his little web of deeds that need to be done about town that none of the people seem to remember exactly what the deeds are until they start doing the deeds um which is like i said is clever uh, some other people are like okay for instance okay we get um we've got brian his deed we find out is he's gonna go smear mud on um someone's clothing and sheets that are out drying you know you know how people some some people use like a the dryer, the washer dryer. Some people just dry their laundry out in the breeze. Well, he goes and smears mud on somebody's laundry that's drying in the breeze. 
which sets off a whole a whole mess of trouble in the town because people are accused of doing this who didn't do it. Little Brian Rusk did it. Now, Mer, um, Myra, she um, goes into the store and she uh, there's a photo of Elvis that she really loves. And Leland Gaunt gives her the photo of Elvis and she takes the photo home. And of course, she has these visions and dreams of dancing and singing with Elvis. So this Elvis photo has a lot of magical properties and her, she's been given a deed that she needs to do. Now, Nettie is another character. She is obsessed with these this lamp, this lampshade that's in the store. And she, Leland Gaunt, gives her a deed to do and, and you can have the lamp. And... um. Now, Alan Pangborn, and then there's a bunch of other people that go into the store that are given, you know, they're they're able to buy stuff for on the cheap, but they they have to do something for Gaunt. Then they can't remember quite what it is they're supposed to do for Gaunt, but they eventually do it because for whatever reason it makes sense at the time to do these crazy things, and they're like, oh, this kind of reminds me of what I was talking about with Leland Gaunt. So I mean, anyway. Very, very interesting. Now, Alan Pangborn, he thinks that this, he goes into needful things. Uh, it takes him a while to get in there, but he's immediately sus. He immediately susses out that something ain't right about this Leland Gaunt. And um, Pangborn slowly starts, starts to um, grow leery of this store and the owner. And the owner, Leland Gaunt himself, slowly starts to grow leery of the sheriff, Pangborn, and they start to become like rivals a little bit. And uh, Leland Gaunt, of course, uses his charming relationship with Polly Chalmers, who's dating the sheriff, to like kind of behind the scenes manipulate a stuff, a lot of stuff in the town that is going to make the sheriff's life more di difficult. Now, Alan Pangborn, of course, he, he you know he remembers Cujo. Uh, he remembers what happened with that crazy rabid dog. He remembers the events of the book, The Dark Half, with the serial killer and how that was sort of a supernatural thing going on. So Alan Pangborn already kind of knows that there's some supernatural X-Files type stuff that happens in Castle Rock. So he's already kind of wise to the fact that Castle Rock ain't quite normal. And so when, of course, Leland Gaunt starts to do stuff that ain't quite normal... It sets off alarm bells in Alan's um, um, brain. And then we get the murders. So Leland Gaunt having people come into a store, offering them things they can't refuse, and then asking them to do these secret deeds. The deeds start to get done. All it does is create chaos between all the people in the small town. And this is where Stephen King does small town better than anybody. I mean, if you read it... If you read, my gosh, even the last book I did a discussion on Dreamcatcher had some great small town stuff in it. But nobody does small town horror like Stephen King. Nobody sets up a small town with such great characters like Stephen King. Like Salem's Lot is another book, much like Needful Things, that just has a great cast of small town people doing small town things. And what Leland Gaunt comes in here and does to this small town is so perfect chaos for small town community to get into. And it's all bad. It's all evil. It goes gory and it goes bloody and it goes off the rails and ass over teapot pretty quick to the point where we got Wilma and Nettie in an epic knife fight about halfway through the book. It's bloody. One of them has a knife. One of them has a cleaver. And they're just in on Main Street just hacking the shit out of each other. These are the first sort of murder slash deaths that happen in the town, which are, everybody's like, oh my gosh. And of course, the reason they're in the knife fight is because, well, someone threw mud on somebody's sheets and someone is accused of throwing mud. Somebody's dog barks a little too loud and I'm going to kill your dog and then I'm going to torture your dog. And then the next thing you know, there's a knife fight on the street. And it is epic. I loved it. It is absolute Stephen King gore to the max. And um, Gaunt, of course, is behind all of it. And he gets more devious and evil as this as this thing goes along. I mean, Sheriff Pangborn, his reaction to the autopsies of these two women that just hacked each other to death in the middle of Main Street with cleavers, his reaction is just, you have to read it to just love it. And I read it and loved it. And then Gaunt, Leland Gaunt and his little store, things just spin into more diabolical evil. I mean, this is kind of like a tale of two cities. This is a very Dickin Dickensian story but of the like the tale of two cities how things just go 
ass backwards, you know, and this, but this is just with one town. Everybody is against each other. Leland Gaunt has sent the entire town against each other. It gets even more diabolical to the point where he's this. He's he's so evil. He starts to sell eagle, illegal pornography to the perverts in the town. And then we get to meet a guy named Ace Merrill, who is legendary in the town. He returns to town about halfway through the book, and he returns. He's like this legendary thug that used to live in Castle Rock, and he's returned to town in his muscle car, in his Dodge Challenger. And he um, goes into needful things thinking that he's the tough guy. And he's going to, I don't know, he, 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 his first foray into needful things is he thinks Gaunt is someone that he can bully. And he finds out through Gaunt's charm that Gaunt, Leland Gaunt even charms Ace Merrill, the town bully. And to the point where Ace Merrill buys a, a lot, Robert Louis Stevenson novel that he has always wanted and he is given a deed. Of course, everybody's given a deed. But the deed, of course, that Ace Merrill gets is um, deals with explosives, terrorism, things like this. And things start to get real diabolical now as um, Gaunt starts to set Polly Chalmers against the sheriff. They're dating. Um, there's, uh, I mean, and then, the, and then things start to spiral into some of the characters get into self-mutilation, suicides, um, you know, involving Brian Rusk's, um, brother, then, and then just the last 50 pages. A lot of people say Stephen King can't nail the ending of a lot of his books. I think that's nonsense. I, I think the endings are pretty good for most of the books. This one has one of the best endings. Um, the last 150 pages are just murders galore, death galore, Stephen King horror galore, giant spiders attacking, exploding bridges. Um, Gaunt um, is a monster himself. He's beaten. And in, in, in the very end, of course, he, he gets um, Alan Pangborn beats him. Alan Pangborn, the sheriff's just sheer goodwill and determination. Um, Saves the day, of course. Gaunt is beaten um, by one of his own tricks. It's kind of like a fake um, snake sort of gag that goes wrong. Um, uh, you know, Gaunt turns into a monster in the end. Um, his death is pretty cool. There's, it's, it's just a belt, basically a melting car. They call it the hell wagon. There's a melting car scene, which is just absolutely dynamite. Um, and it's one of the things... Um, King does, uh, it's one of the best endings, is just Leland Gaunt goes out in a um, fiery car melting death wagon, hell wagon type of death scene, and it's dope. Um, it's just, uh, I like this book so much. I mean, I there's, like, The Stand, I think I've read uh, close to ten times. It, I've read maybe five or six times. Needful Things, this was probably the fourth or fifth time I've read it. And um, it's one of the ones I've read, and there's probably a handful of other books of, his, of King's that I've read four or five times. So it is one of my favorites. Um, it's a quintessential Castle Rock, Maine, New England, October, Halloween-ish, fall leaves are raining down and all the fall colors type of horror novel. Um, you can just picture the scene. Stephen King does a great job of picturing the fall weather in Castle Rock, Maine, absolutely gorgeously throughout the book. It's just absolutely, it's just cool. It's just a cool horror novel. A very good look at small town America and the, um, just the pettiness of small town and how Leland Gaunt, um, uses the pettiness of people to just, and, and the thing that's, the thing that's the best about the whole evil guy Leland Gaunt is, why is he doing it? What purpose does he have of turning this town against each other? Um, in the end, and it's spoken several times throughout the book, it's just Leland Gaunt enjoys doing this shit. He just likes it. He's just that guy. He's just the dude that likes to go. He's just the crazy, devilish, demon character, sort of Dark Lord Sauron type guy that just does bad to be bad. Like Voldemort, like, you know, the character, the, the evil character 
a Randall Flagg, the Dark Tower guy, the uh, Leland Gaunt. I think in all of Stephen King books, it's the same dude. There's a Dark Lord that rules over the Stephen King multiverse, and he is present in Leland Gaunt. And it's just because Dark Lords do Dark Lord shit. And for no reason other than they get a kick out of it, seeing people suffer. And that's it. That's There's no, like, big, like, there's no, like, real theme behind this other than people in small towns can be petty. And if you've ever lived in a small town, you know that. And Stephen King exploits that. And Leland Gaunt, the bad guy in this, exploits that to the delight of myself and many other Stephen King fans because it's a bloody book. It's a bloody good book. It's a bloody fun book. But overall, it's a bloody book, and it's awesome. And there's an epilogue. There's an epilogue here, folks, that I have wanted to see a sequel to this. I want to see a sequel to Needful Things at some point because the epilogue lets us thinks us makes us think that there might be someday because the epilogue is we travel to junction city iowa iowa where in the very final paragraph of this book we realize that there is another needful things opening up in small town junction city iowa and omg what might be going on in junction city iowa right now because of needful things I would have, you know, you know, needful things. We all need a needful things store. We all need, I'd, I'd do dirty deeds for Leland Gaunt for, uh, you know, stuff that I want. I mean, I, I'm that guy, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I could be suckered into it. I could be suckered into it. You know, there's things that I want, you know, I mean, there's things that I can't afford that I'd like. And if, if that meant going and throwing mud on, uh, you know, Myra's, uh, sheets as they dry in the wind do it you can do it who cares who cares right am i right am i right i think i might be right <laughs>